America is bracing for Trump 2.0, an older but more powerful Donald Trump. It's a strange situation here because usually elections have a finality to them. You forget the divisions and the debate, you get down to work. But around here, it's the opposite. The Democrats simply cannot wrap their heads around what happened. A bit like in 2016, they're not ready to accept a Trump presidency. And don't get me wrong, they're not storming the U.S. Capitol. But there is a sense of denial. Yesterday, President Joe Biden tried to address that. He gave a speech from the White House. He promised a smooth and professional transition. But beyond that, he gave an important message too. You can't love your country only when you win. Listen to this. Yesterday, I spoke with President-elect Trump to congratulate him on his victory. And I assured him that I would direct my entire administration to work with his team to ensure a peaceful and orderly transition. We accept the choice the country made. I've said many times, you can't love your country only when you win. You can't love your neighbor only when you agree. We all get knocked down. <clears throat> but the measure of our character, as my dad would say, is how quickly we get back up. Remember, a defeat does not mean we are defeated. We lost this battle. I know it's the bare minimum, but it was a very mature and graceful address from Joe Biden, especially if you look at the history. In 2020, when Biden won, Trump did not extend him this courtesy. He disputed the election results. Clearly, Joe Biden wants to be the bigger man. But here's the problem. A lot of Democrats blame him for the loss. They blame his policy on Israel, his decision to not step aside earlier, and his campaign gaps. The White House spokesperson faced some of these questions later in the day. Listen to her response. Running again, not stepping aside faster, and showing what some people say, quoting folks here, <coughs> an arrogance of believing he was the only one who could beat Donald Trump. You said something at the end that I do want to just kind of reiterate and remind remind folks, uh, and it was a good reminder to me, which is like, look, the president, this is the president who has been the only person has been able to beat Donald Trump. It's a strange moment for Joe Biden. He must defend his record. He can't blame his vice president, and he must be courteous, courteous to Donald Trump. Not an easy balance to strike. And don't forget, he's still got a country to run. Trump will take charge only on the 20th of January. Until then, Joe Biden must handle two wars while preparing his country for a second Trump presidency. It's not going to be easy. Americans are deeply divided over this result. We've seen celebrations by Trump supporters across America, but we've also seen protests. Take a look at this. And what is Trump up to? His cabinet is slowly starting to take shape. He's already picked his chief of staff, a political strategist from Florida, Susie Wiles. She was co-chair of the Trump campaign, and she will now run Donald Trump's White House. Wiles will be the first woman to hold this post. And what do we know about her? Well, she's a longtime Republican. She worked on Ronald Reagan's campaign, on Donald Trump's first campaign, and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis' campaign. She likes to stay be behind the scenes. On Wednesday, Trump called her up, up to the podium to say a few words, but she flatly refused. Insiders say she ran a professional campaign, which can be hard with Trump because he rarely sticks to a given script or agenda. But her biggest challenge starts now. Trump ran through four chiefs of staff in his first term. One of them later called him a fascist. Plus, this Trump team will be more volatile. The likes of Elon Musk and Tucker Carlson will be jostling for influence. So Susie Wiles needs to keep them in line. As for Donald Trump, he's ready to hit the ground running. Yesterday, he spoke to the U.S. media. He said around 70 world leaders, 70, 70 world leaders had spoken to him. That's a lot of phone calls in two days. But his focus remains on domestic issues, especially his promises on the southern border with Mexico. Listen to what he said.
We obviously have to make the border strong and powerful and we have to at the same time. We want people to come into our country. When people have killed and murdered, when drug lords have destroyed countries, and now they're going to go back to those countries because they're not staying here. He wants people to come, but legally, which is a fair ask, but that's not his only border promise. Trump has vowed the largest deportation in U.S. history. He wants to round up illegal migrants and send them back to their home country. And how many people are we talking about? There is no official number, but some reports say it could be as many as 11 million people. 11 million. Now, this raises a couple of questions. One, how do you find, round up and detain so many people? And two, how much will it cost? Democrats have painted a grim picture about this plan. They say migrants will be put up in detention camps, but Trump allies say it will be targeted. No citywide or neighborhood sweeps. Either way, logistics will be a nightmare, which brings us to the costs. In 2016, the cost of deporting an illegal migrant was almost $13,000. That's apprehension plus detention plus processing and finally flying them out. Trump was asked about the viability of such a program. He says the price tag doesn't matter. But expect political challenges. Trump will need the help of all departments and U.S. states for such a program. And chances are he won't get it. Some states are Trump-proofing their laws, like California, New York, Massachusetts and Washington. California's governor, Gavin Newsom, is planning to convene his lawmakers. He plans to fight Trump's proposed policies. And how is that? By giving more money to his attorney general. Basically, California is lawyering up. They want to fight Trump's proposed laws in court, or at least hold them up. Other Democratic states are doing the same, so expect some standoffs next year. A few federal officials could also clash with Trump, like Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell. He heads America's Central Bank. Trump had appointed Powell back in 2018. He got a second term from Joe Biden. Now, Powell was asked if, if he would resign if Trump asked him to. And his response, a defiant no. Some of the president's elect's advisors have suggested that you should resign. Um, if he asked you to leave, would you go? No. Uh, can you follow up on, is, is, do you think that legally he did, you're not required to leave? No. Legally, Trump cannot fire him. Powell's term lasts until May 2026. He is protected by the U.S. Constitution, but expect some public acrimony and tensions because last time Trump clashed repeatedly with him. The president wanted to cut interest rates. Jerome Powell said not the right time. Trump also threatened to fire him on many occasions, including in the middle of the pandemic. So considering all of this, one thing is certain. America is set for a dramatic four years. Trump could have absolute power in Washington, but he will face pushbacks from states and federal officials. How that plays out will depend on the president. Hello and welcome to this special edition of Vantage, live from the White House. America is Trump country again. He will be the 47th president of the United States of America. They're live from the White House, soon to be the new residence of Donald Trump. It was also here that Donald Trump brokered the Abraham Accords. So the voters have a legitimate question in their minds. If those presidents could do it, why not Joe Biden? The Arab voters want to punish the Democrats for supporting Israel. Joe Biden's shadow looms large over this election and Kamala Harris may end up paying the price for it. This Trump hat, it says, President Trump save America. But this hat is made in China. And this is the Chinese interference that Americans must be investigating. But off late, Donald Trump and the Republicans have made some gains. And the biggest reason for that is illegal immigration. This is more than just a march, they say. This is a demand for accountability. The excitement, the tension is palpable. You can see the security presence. You can see the number of police cars, government buildings like these against, again, fenced up. We are at Harvard University, the alma mater of Kamala Harris. As the night progressed, uh, numbers came in thick and fast, and Donald Trump was soon declared the winner. It's been called a historic comeback. Another American presidency will begin. In Donald Trump's case, his second one.